teaching you a portion of scripture that is very, very familiar to you. Even the heathens know about it. Based out of 1 Samuel chapter 17 about David and Goliath. Um, I don't know, I challenged you last week about fasting. I don't know who fasted. Um, I, I did three day, I did a three-day water fast. I know a bunch of you guys fasted. And, and for the remainder of the year, I'm challenging you to at least at least do a meal or fast coffee or something once a week or whatever you can do. Whatever I don't everybody's at different places and spaces. And so um, I've challenged myself to do it. Meredith is gonna do it, even my children are doing it. And so um, I, I want to make sure that we are a church that is advancing at some, at some level spiritually. As I said last week, there's some breakthroughs that don't happen unless you fast and pray. There were some demons that didn't cast out when the disciples asked, why can't we cast this out? Jesus said, well, those don't cast out. That kind of a breakthrough doesn't happen unless you fast and pray. So I'm, I'm here to declare to you that there's some breakthroughs in our lives that we're wanting, but some of them you have to operate in principle, right? So all the promises of God, they're always a yes and an amen, but to every promise comes principle. And if you operate the principle, the promise unfolds and unlocks. And a lot of times we just think, well, it's a finished work. I'm just going to declare it and have a good confession. All that is, 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 is part of it, but it's not all of it. You have to take the principle because wisdom is the principal thing. God's word is full of wisdom, therefore it's full of principles. And if you work the principles, the principles will work and un unlock the promise for your life. And so um, I just want to make sure that you get that because I'm gonna teach you today on a wonderful principle. I'm gonna read a text and I'm gonna tell you what the principle is. And I'm going to stay on that one principle. Usually I give you three principles. I'm going to give you one principle that if by the time I get done, hopefully you'll understand and understand a, a greater level of what you've been called to, what you were created for, and what you were commissioned to. Okay? And so that you can be empowered to do whatever God said for you to do so that you don't wander in a wilderness like the children of Israel. I want you to be very my, I want to be very intentional today to make sure I do that. So I'm not after so much preaching a good sermon so that you like it and go, ooh, praise God, hallelujah, oh, pastor, preach your my, my heart is, is a lot of times when I come up here, when I teach you and preaching to you, you don't know this, but I'm preaching to myself. Sometimes you got to encourage your own self. And a lot of times I have to encourage myself on a Sunday morning and you get the benefits of it. The last couple of Sundays, that has been it. And this kind of Sunday is something that I've experienced, okay? I've had to walk this out over the years that I have a relationship with the Lord. And so I just want to share my, my revelation and my experience. And so I want to, I believe it'll help you out in your Christian walk. Amen. So if we read a portion of scripture, I'm just going to read one portion of scripture out of 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 48 through 50. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried <laughs> and he ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Notice it wasn't the Philistines, plural. It was the Philistine, the uncircumcised giant. So it was when the Philistine arose, oh, excuse me. So it was that when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, and David hurried, oh, I already read that, sorry. Then David put his hand in his bag, I love this, and took out a stone, and he slung it, and he struck the Philistine in his forehead, so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. Verse 50 says, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Help, help me, Holy Spirit, convey and articulate with words, words that are evil, easy and able to be understood, that it penetrate and bypass the brain 
and let it drop into the heart of every hearing, of, of every ear to hear. And I am asking somehow, somewhere, Lord God, that a miracle would transpire, that you would ignite, charge, challenge, and change your people in the next 30 to 35 minutes. Amen and amen. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, listen. We're living in, in crucial days. We're living in crucial days and where people are easily tossed by every wind of doctrine, okay? You look on social media, you got people saying this. I mean, when the eclipse came, my God, it was the end of the world. It was an apocalypse. Jesus is coming back. It was the end of the world. Listen, it's come and gone, just like, remember, 2000, Y2K, we're going to be wiped out and gone. Listen, I got tired of all that. And we got people saying all kinds of stuff, all kinds of, now it's, everybody's a prophet, right? I mean, never been to school, never been sat under nobody, but you got a following, so now you're going to say whatever God, and it's mostly young people. And so I, I'm picking on him because now you got a following, and now, you know, you got a bigger following than most pastors, and now you're going to say what you, but the thing is, is you're not grounded. And so easily everything, we're moved to and fro with every wind of doctrine, and if there's anything that we have to do is a people that are going to be grounded in truth, because truth is going to be the very thing that will save and deliver, and all only thing that will set free and liberate you. And so we need truth. David said, I need truth from the inward parts. I got to be established in truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so we need to be a people that are going to be established and rooted in truth, uh, Hosea the prophet says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So, so it's, it's sometimes what you don't know is the things that you will suffer from. So God is wanting you to know. God is wanting you to be edumacated, right? God, God is wanting you to understand. Because part of knowledge is understanding and all by getting Solomon said get understanding what, what good is it for you to have knowledge and not understand what is being taught so knowledge is necessary knowledge is necessary it's a principal thing to have knowledge and to have wisdom but man if you're going to get anything get understanding right understanding gives is, is, is the instructions you know that that will help you get to what you need you can have knowledge and you can have the instructions and all of that, but still you have to learn to understand the, the instructions, right? When the kids were growing up, Raquel had her first dollhouse. You know, it was some assembly was required. I don't read instructions because I'm a man. I look at pictures. I'll have a few bolts left over, but it looks like the house on the, on the box. Leave me alone. But so we need understanding. And so I say all that because we come to a place where God is wanting really for all of us to understand not just him, okay, but he's wanting us to understand ourselves through him. And so it's crucial that we know that. So, but before you understand yourself through him, you have to understand him. And one of the principles that I want to drive home today, one of the principles, it's a, really a gigantic principle for me, and I've been on it all year. Some of you have heard it, but, you know, I feel like reiterating a lot of it, and it's, 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 it's really, um, it's, it's, it's a principle that is very, very necessary in the body of Christ, okay? It, it is uh, the principle of exception. God is, the, God is the God of exception, okay? Um, geez, when I was in eighth grade, um, I got in trouble. Can you believe that? I know. Uh, I got in trouble because my eighth grade teacher, you could chew gum in his class and you can eat in his class, well, you couldn't chew gum and eat in anybody else's classroom. The only thing you can do in everybody else's classroom was drink water. But in his classroom, you could eat and you can have, you could chew bubble gum, but you couldn't take a drink from the fountain. Well, 
I thought that was the dumbest thing in the world, especially that I came from PE into history, and he was a history teacher, and I, my name starts with a Z, so I was always in the back. And you know where the fountain was, right? Right there. It was the devil tempting me right there. Take a drink, take a drink, take a drink. I dare you, take a drink, take a drink. So I gave in like the good, you know, devil worshiper at the time I was, you know. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so, so I gave in. I took a drink. Guess what? I got 15-minute detention. And, and I thought to me, that was the dumbest thing. I just ran a mile, you know, in the eighth grade. They, back then, they, they had a, they, 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 uh, you had to do a time to see how fast you ran a mile. I don't know who wanted to know. But we ran a mile. And then I come back into history because you only got, what, 10 minutes to change and get to class. And so here I am. I'm running down there. And guess what? I'm thirsty. So I get, I get some water. I defy the rule, because I'm thinking I'm the exception. I get 15 minutes. I get 30 minutes. I have an hour detention. I figured I was already an hour, let's make it three, because that's just the kind of guy I was. And he says, you know the rule. I stood up and said, I think that's a dumb rule. I said, the dumb rule about it is you can eat in your class, and you can chew gum in your class, but you can't drink water in your class, which to me is a double standard. <laughs> now, I'm only 14 years old. How can I be smarter than the teacher? So he sent me to the principal's office. So I went to the principal's office, and the principal, Mr. Erickson, called my dad. I don't know if you remember dad. And he says, Mr. Zamora, you need to come pick up your son. And my dad said, for what? So when he got there, the principal said, well, he drank water. And my dad goes, what? You're, 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 you're suspending him for drinking water? My dad goes, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. I said, Dad, you can eat in this class, and you can chew gum in this class. He's the only class you can't drink water in. So my dad said to the principal, well, if you don't want him to drink water in the classroom, take the water fountain out of the classroom. <laughs> principal said, good point. Go ahead and go back to class. I went back to class. He said, I'll deal with the, I'll deal with the teacher later. I sat back in my, in my thing, and I said, I'm going to get up, and I got myself a drink of water. Everybody looked at me laughing. The teacher's bowling. He says, what do you think you're doing? I said, I'm the exception. <laughs> Put your hands right there together. Because by the end of today, you're going to understand that you are the exception. God created you to be the exception. God, listen, he created you to be the, he called you to be the exception. He commissioned you to be the exception. You are the exception. Baby, drink the water. You're the exception. An exception, an except, the, the exception is an, an anomaly, okay? It's, it's, it's a deviation of, a, uh, it's a deviation of a, of a common rule. Basically is, what happened to me shouldn't happen or couldn't happen unless God or my dad made it happen. Did you get that? So, so you're, you're breaking the rule of something that you shouldn't or couldn't have the ability to do it unless somebody else stepped in and made it happen for you. In that case, it was my dad. He made it happen, okay, because he's the man. My daddy's stronger than yours, eh. right? <laughs> so, so, so you see that you're the exception. I, I, I say that because it's, ne it's, it's necessary that we understand that when you understand you're the exception, it brings you into a place of confidence. 
God had always intended for you to understand that you need to be the accept the, the acceptance is here, okay? The exception, excuse me. Because you need to know that so that you can have confidence in what God's called you to be and become in the earth. You're the exception. And the Bible is full. In fact, the Bible is inundated by stories and examples and examples for us of people that we're the exception. The Bible is full of stories, and if you read it as a storybook and only a storybook, then you're going to be misled a little bit because those were great stories. But the thing about the Bible is those Bibles aren't just stories that we read. Those stories are still stories that are being lived out in everybody's lives in different levels, right? And so... When you understand about the acceptance, when you come back to God, not, not everybody at 90 years old, listen, not everybody at 90 years old can get pregnant. Any 90-year-old in here want to get pregnant? Okay, like I'm saying is, not every 90-year-old woman has the ability to get pregnant unless God makes an exception, and he made an exception with Sarah. And the reason why he made an exception with Sarah, uh, he made an exception with Sarah, was to show you and to show me that God can empower you to give birth to something in a season, in a season that everybody thinks is too late. Did you hear me? The reason God gave Sarah and gave him birth, not only to give us an Isaac, but he come in 2024, we look at the story and say, you know, if God did it for Sarah, then that means God can empower me regardless of my age, and he can empower me to give birth to whatever God's called me to give birth in a season when everybody thinks it's too late. Can I get a witness in the house? So Sarah is the accepted. Now, it, it, listen, Daniel, it, it's, it's impossible to get into a lion's den and be uns, unscathed and unscarred unless you're the exception. God says, I'm going to make the exception with Daniel. Because, see, God wanted to show us through Daniel him being unscathed and unharmed. Listen, he wanted to show you and he wanted to show me Listen, that it doesn't matter when people put you in lion's dens, that regardless they want to see you devoured and destroyed, that God can shut the mouth of every lion devil and cause you the next day to come out of your pit. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's impossible for you to go into fiery furnaces. Oh, yes, and survive. And they turning it up seven times hotter. Oh, yes. Unless you're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you become the except you become the exception. And the reason why God, oh, let uh, 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 Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go through the fiery furnace and then not even coming out smelling like smoke, he was wanting to tell us. Oh, he was wanting to show you, and he was wanting to show me, and he was wanting to show us that if people put you in fiery places and fiery furnace, and they want to see you destroyed, that God would be the fourth man in the midst of the fire. That when he stood up and showed you that he was never leave you nor forsake you, that when he began to show up, oh, you wouldn't even come out. When you came out, you would not even smell like You want more? Yeah. Birds, birds don't feed men. Men feed birds. But God made an exception with Elijah. In the middle of famine where there was no food, oh, and water was scarce, God leads Elijah to the brook Cherith. Oh, he got to quench his thirst there at the brook. But he got hungry, and God says, I'm going to make a bird fly into the palace. And in the palace, I'm going to steal a ribeye tomahawk 
from the king. And I'm going to put it right there in the river Cherith. Right, and give it to the prophet. It's my, pro it's my sermon. Leave it alone. And he's there eating. I see, he's the exception. And the reason why God allowed him to go through that was to show me and you ah, that God is able in the middle of a famine to bring you Jehovah Jireh. He's the one that will seed and he will provide for your need. That in the midst of darkness, in the midst of obscurity, in the midst of nothing, that something will suddenly appear because he's that kind of God and he makes you the exception. Yes. And it's amazing that walls don't come tumbling down. Oh, when you walk around a city for six days each day, and then on the seventh day you walk seven times, and then you shout. It doesn't make no sense for a city to fall and crumble down, but God makes Joshua the exception. Are you kidding me? And he shows Joshua as the exception to show you and me that if you begin to obey him, obedience is better than sacrifice. That this is just not your prayer, it's your obedience to the prayer. That when you can obey and pray and stay out of God's way, that God has an ability to do something far greater than you could ever do it. So he allowed us to go through that. You understand that? And so the last but not least, come on, somebody. Uh, not everybody can be, not everybody can go, come on, to, 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 to get uh, scorned and whipped and then walk the Via Dolorosa. Come on, and then come to Calvary's cross and be crowned there and crucified. And then you know what? He, was, he would die there, and then he would be buried, and then he would on the third day rise again. Not any man can survive that, but God made an exception for a man called Jesus. And if he did it for Sarah, and if he did it for Daniel, and if he did it for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and if he did it for Elijah, and if he did it for Joshua, and if he did it for Jesus, he'll do it for you. Why? Because you are called. You are commissioned. You have been created to be the exception. And if you're the exception, you've got to understand that there is an anointing on my life of exception. I am being smothered with oil of being accepted and I, there's an exception round about me that I become next in line and when you know that you're next in line you're next in line for a breakthrough you're next in line for a miracle you're next in line for your healing you're next in line for your business endeavor you're next in line to get married you're next in line to find somebody oh you got to die. somebody in here just say I'm next I'm next I'm next it's my turn. Why? Because you're the exception. You're the exception. Come on, elbow somebody and say, I'm the exception. Come on, elbow your other one. Just said, man, I'm next. I'm next. I'm next. And, the, and the, reason, the reason I say that is because the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. He, he, do, he doesn't care about your competence, what God has given you, what you have. The enemy wants your confidence. Because if he gets your confidence, he'll get your competence. So he's after your confidence. But what he doesn't understand, listen to me, is that, that the calling and the giftings are without repentance, that even God can't pull back what he gave to you. So if God can't pull it back from you, what makes you think the devil can pull it back from you? Let me go even a step further. What makes, it, what makes you think you can do it? And the only way you honestly can do it, since I'm on the subject, is when you don't understand who you are. When you don't understand who you are, you lose your confidence. And then you lose your competence. And so then you wander into a wilderness when God wanted you to inherit a promised land. But if you don't know what you've been called to, and you don't know what you've been created for, and you don't know what you've been commissioned to, you're the exception. 
The children of Israel, God told them that I've given you the land that flows with milk and honey. And so they have faith. I've been saying it for years. They had faith to come out of bondage. And they were going through the wilderness and had faith to even wander in the wilderness till they came to the brink of the promised land. Years ago, I, 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 used, I, I preached a sermon called Get Out of Shittim. That's, that's actually a word in Hebrew. I'm not cussing. And it means easy to, be, easy to get into but hard to get out. Notice it's always at the brink of the promised land. So easy to get in, but it's so hard to come out. Shit them. You ever been in that place? So easy. I better, I better move on because that's not my sermon. Maybe next week. But we're in Canaan land. And they, they have faith to come out, faith to go through, and they don't have faith to go in. I'll prove to you in Numbers 13. Can you put that up for me? I want you to, I want you to read this. It says, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. We're going to overcome all these crazy giants. Then Caleb quieted, uh, next verse. It says, but the, it says, but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. They're giants, okay? It says, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies uh, uh, in the land, says, that devours its inhabitants, and all of the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. They're giants. It says, there, were, and there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. I have said this for years. The problem with them having confidence and faith to come out of bondage, go through the wilderness, but then they come to the brink of a promised land, you know, what happens is, is you have to overcome you. The giant... The giants in the promised land were not the problem. It wasn't how they saw God that was the problem. It was how they saw themselves was the problem. They, weren't, they were more afraid of a, God, of a grasshopper in here than the giants out there. And when you're more afraid of the grasshopper in here than the giants out there, then you lose your confidence and your competence. And you settle for a wilderness that God never intended for you to settle for. Because you have the right view of God, you just didn't have the right view of yourself. And the reality is, the reality is, is the word grasshopper is the word insignificant. It's actually the word also inadequate. Your inadequacies and insignificance, your inabilities, your insecurities, all the things that hinder you from your confidence, come on, will, will, isn't it amazing that the moment God puts a call on your life, your inadequacies come and erupt. They trigger, every single trigger of your inadequacies come forth. Case in point, Moses, I want you to go ahead and be deliverer and deliver the people out of Israel. First of all, his inadequacies. I can't, I stutter. God never said you don't. He never said, I, I, I know. He didn't say, no, I know you're a stutterer. God already knew he stuttered. God says, I'm going to use your, you anyhow. Because you're the exception. You're the exception because you were the only Hebrew boy that was raised in, in Pharaoh's court. You know how things work. So you know how everybody should be talking to the king. So therefore, you're going to train, even though you're not going to talk, you're going to use Aaron. God says, I'm going to use Aaron, but you're going to train Aaron how to talk to a king because you were born in, in, in the throne. You were raised on the courts of Pharaoh. You're the exception. 
And it's necessary you understand that because when your calling, when your calling comes forth, your, 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 the trigger of your inadequacies will come forth. Jeremiah, I've called you to be a prophet to the nations. I need you to pluck up, destroy, plant. Next thing he says, uh, uh, but I'm just but a youth. God never disagreed with him. Yeah, I don't care about you, you're a youth. I don't care about your inadequacies. I don't care about your insignificance. Deal with them. I said, I've called you to be a prophet to the nations. That's your calling. you got to know not very many young guys are going to be called to be prophets. But Jeremiah, you're the exception. So when you know you've been created, when you know you've been called, and you know you've been commissioned to be the exception, it should shift the trajectory of your life. It should shift and change the way you think. It should shift and change the way you even act because when you change the way you think, it changes your behavior. Religion has always wanted to change your behavior but never ever give you inspiration or direction to destiny. It was just waiting for an any minute departure. Are you getting this? You have to understand that religion doesn't want you to have relationship. It just wants you to have behavior. You, you need to behave good. Don't cuss. You know, don't drink. Don't smoke. Don't go with the girls that do. You know, it's, it's all that, that, that stuff, the do's and the don'ts, right? And so they try to change your behavior, and you can be disciplined to change your behavior. You can rehabilitate an old man. Paul the apostle did it. But then at the end when he did it, he says, I'm the chiefest of sinners because I did it in my own righteousness. God does, listen to me. You say, well, I don't cuss. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't chew. I'm a good person. I know, but you're religious. Yeah. And, you, and, and, and you're mean. And you're self-righteous. Okay, nobody here. I'll talk to people, but no, I like those guys. Over here somewhere. Right? It's like, yeah. You're so religious. You've been religious for 50 years. Maybe a strong drink will help you out. I don't know. <laughs> just saying. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not condoning it. I'm just saying it. Loosen up a little bit. Be nice. Be nice. Okay? Because I know a lot of people don't have behavior, but they got relationship. And God's working on their behavior. Because we make it all about, well, you know, one, one man that God told me, well, I don't cuss. And I said, well, you're a liar. He goes, no, I don't cuss. I said, I know, you're a liar. He goes, no, I do not cuss. I said, I know, you're a liar. He goes, hmm. He goes, well, why am I a liar? I said, because in the new covenant, you don't have to say it. All you have to do is think it. And you're telling me you don't, never thought about cussing somebody out? At least 25,000 times a day, I think. Not as much as my mother, but I'm all, I'm coming close. Right? And so in the new covenant, it's because we think we, well, I don't do it. Yeah, but you think it. I heard one preacher says, all preachers that cuss, uh, and I'm not condoning it. I'm just, I'm, it's just I'm, since I'm on the, I'm just rabbit trailing. I heard one guy said, well, every, every preacher that cusses has a broken spirit. I said, well, that's all of us. That's why we live by grace. We all have lived from different parts. You don't know where I came from. You don't know my upbringing. I know some people that are born again filled with the spirit and can operate in the miraculous, but they, were, they grew up under the mob. And so they got a filthy mouth, and they're clean compared to what they used to be, and God is still working on them. Anyway... As I was saying a moment ago, you're the exception, right? You're the exception. God, God's wanting you to understand. Well, why, would you, why, would you, why would you not come in to the promise God has granted and given to you because of your inadequacies? Listen to me. All of us have them. Each and every one have them. We have, I have inabilities. I came up here today without notes thinking, I don't know, I'm going to screw this up. I don't know. And then I had to say, I don't care if I screw up. 
there's next Sunday. Because my notes are right here. And I just have four things I really wanted to say. And one main thing is that you're the exception. I'm going to do it with a story and hopefully you're being blessed. And the reality is this. we got to deal with the stinking thinking in our head. Because if we have a good view of God but not a good view of ourselves, then we're going to forfeit. When God is wanting to inher- want us to inherit the promised land. But we'll never come into it. We'll be stuck in a place of easily being going in and hard to come out. Shit him. Oh, gone it. I didn't want to say it. You made me say it. And so we have to understand that, right? So, so when you've got a good view of God and you've got a good view of you, see, that's ontology, right? If you take my class, you'll understand that, right, Aaron? Eric? So, so it's ontology. When you get ontology right, when you get God right, you get you right. When you get you right, then you get your confidence back. When you get your confidence back, you get your confidence back. When you get your confidence back, now you can put your head up, your shoulders back, and begin to walk by faith and not by sight. And, you're, and, and you realize that in the midst of it, and you find yourself in a fight, you realize that it's a fixed fight. God, God had prepared the, the children of Israel to have the, the, the promised land, and it was already a fixed fight. But because they didn't see themselves right, they had to forfeit. And so many Christians forfeit what God has for them because they think they're going to have to come in there and fight. You're not going to go in there and fight. You're going to go in there, maybe fight, but it's going to be a fixed fight. That's the title of my message, by the way, is that it's a fixed fight. But you've got to know that in the midst of it that you're the exception. That you shouldn't win. Yeah, the odds are against you. He's meaner. He's stronger. She's faster. But the thing is, is you know what? You're the exception. Why? Because God created me as the exception. He called me to be the exception. He commissioned me to be the exception. So I must receive the exception. And when I receive the exception, I can put my head up, shoulders back, walk by faith, not by sight, and say in the name of Jesus, if it's a fight you want, it's a fight you're going to get. But I refuse to bow down. I refuse to get stuck. I refuse to battle in my mind. I refuse to have a wrong thinking about myself. I'm going to have a right thinking of who God is and then whoever as he is so am I in this world and when I can see myself right I'm going to walk by confidence and faith and begin to stand and I don't care what giant stands I'm going to go ahead and crucify I'm going to annihilate the grasshopper the inadequacies the inabilities my insecurities everything that holds me back everything that holds me stuck to the past and handcuffs me I got news for you when you can deal with that God will prevail God will raise you up. God will give you a confidence where you will shake yourself like Samson and bring forth what you were called to do. It's a fixed fight. I said it's a fixed fight. You should smile. That's the good news. It's a fixed fight. Candy, it's a fixed fight. I don't know what I got to tell you, but in the next three months, You'll see whatever you've been fighting fixed like that. It's a fixed fight. So I said all that, the principle of exception, to bring you to the text. So that was your sign of the piano player. For those of you getting baptized, you can go change now too. I said all of that because David has a story. This David has a story. And it's not necessarily a good one. The stone that the Builders rejected. This one became the chief cornerstone. That was a messianic prophecy of Christ Jesus, but it was lived out through David. It was a prophecy to David. David was the chief cornerstone, he was the type of Christ, rejected by his brothers. And his father. When the prophet came and Saul was rejected by God because he messed up one time, 
Saul messed up one time. God rejected him. You want to know why God rejected him since I'm on it? Because, because he didn't repent. Saul screwed up one time, didn't repent, so God couldn't trust him. David, on the other hand, screws up a million times, but he runs to God every time, and God says, he's the apple of my eye. I can trust David. The difference between David and Saul was that God could trust David because David ran every time he screwed up because God knows all of us are screwed up. But he tells Samuel, he says, how long are you going to mourn for Saul, whom I rejected? Take, take the horn of oil, fill it, and go to Jesse's house because I'm going to anoint me a king. And the seer, the prophet, the seer is going to Jesse's house. And surely he calls Eliab, the oldest. Surely the Lord is on this man. Whew. It's sad that God has to rebuke the seer who can't see. Because he's still stuck on the past and what worked in the past. And God said, I'm done with that. You better move on. That's a prophetic word for somebody. You, you, you can't get stuck back there. You got to move on. I've had to live that out. Being a pastor, you live that out. People come and go, and you have to, you know what? You got to say, I got I to move on. I got to keep going. Because I, I know what I've been called to do. I know, I know what I've been created to do. And I know what I've been commissioned to do. And you got to put your head up, your shoulders back. And walk by faith and not by sight and put a smile on your face knowing that I know who God is and I know who I am and I know what he's called me to do. And I realize that you may not like it, but baby, I'm the exception. <laughs> and so David now is in the sheepfold. His brothers now can smell the anointing of kingship. Only problem is the rabbinic teachers will tell you that it wasn't that Samuel didn't try to pour. It's that he poured, tried to pour the oil, but the oil receded. It got stuck. It wouldn't come out. But God, ref God refused to pour oil on, on somebody that was not called and created and commissioned and who was not the exception. And Samuel, you know, the story goes into the it's a, it, it, to Jesse, he says, do you have another son? He goes, well, yeah, we got a, we got a little brat over there who is always in trouble and cusses too much and, you know, crazy, likes to fight, kills lions and bears on spare time. I don't know what's, something's wrong with him. Got anger problems, but, you know, he sings, gets his harp. I don't know, he does, sings to the Lord a, a new song, and then, then he's fine. And he acts up and he's crazy again and, and he'll sing. He'll sing like crazy little poems. Like, hear my cry, oh God. Oof. And tend unto my prayer from the ends of the earth. Well, I cry unto you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lord, lead me to the rock. Lord, lead me to the rock. Lead me. Lead me to the rock. Lead me to the rock. That is higher than I. For thou, O oh Lord, art a shield and strength. You're the glory and the lifter of my head. And he would just sing poem after poem. Rock 
walk out like a rock star on a harp. There was something on David. He says, well, that's the one I want. David comes and the oil begins to fall. And for the first time in front of his whole family, listen to me, he was working in the field. He was with his brothers. He was with his parents. And none of them saw a king within them. David had to kill his own inadequacies and his own insecurities and his own insignificances. And the only way he can do that was when he cried unto the Lord. It was when he would cry to the Lord and he would run to God and said, I know my daddy doesn't see the king in me. I know my brothers don't see the king in me. But Lord, I know you said that I'm the exception. I know that I am next. I know I have pictured and I have dreamed and I have sung about the oil that is smothered on me, that is so smothered that, Father, it will break, an, uh, the anointing will break yokes and remove burden. You have called me to kingship. You have called me to rule. You've called me to reign. Yes, I'm a brat. I might cuss a little bit, but God, I run to you. I know I'm a man that can be trusted. I know I'm the exception, God, and I'm telling you, I thank you. God says, you're the apple of my eye, David. And he anoints him right in the middle square in front of everybody. And from that moment, the Bible says, and the Holy Spirit came upon David. And then David comes now. After he had been anointed, he goes straight back into the sheepfold doing what he was supposed to be doing. What do you do when your anointing is greater than your assignment? When I was 20 years old, I was probably 23 years old, I became my mom and dad's associate pastor. When I was 25 years old, I could do it and say it better than them. I had an anointing. And still, what do you do when your anointing is greater than the assignment? You stay, on, you stay doing the assignment until God commissions you. For seven years, I sat under their ministry. I didn't go. I mean, one time I left, I came back. What do you do? You stay faithful to what God told you to do until he tells you to do something next. Everybody that wants a microphone, listen, I didn't, have, I didn't get a chance. My mom and dad knew my wife and I were called, but they knew in the church we were at, we didn't have room, we wouldn't have room to do it. So you know what my mom and dad did? They planted a church with 50 people. They started a church. And the only, the only reason I believe that church existed wasn't so that they can pastor a church. The only reason that church ex existed was to give me and Meredith training room for what we can do what we're doing now. That's why I thank God for them. That's why they're on staff with me and I pay them. You know, I pay them. I pay them really good. Because I wouldn't be doing what I do without them. These two are my spiritual mom and dad. I have a bishop. That's my mom and dad. She prayed me in the kingdom. You give honor to whom honor is due. You want somebody to pray, let her pray for you. When I'm in trouble, I don't run to my bishop first. I run to my mom and dad. I love my bishop, but I know where the anointing is. I know where I got my anointing. Jesus, stop it. You understand that? Anyway, so David's called now. He's, his, his dad goes, you need to take these cheeses and some bread and take them to the captains of David, uh, your brothers, and just say hello to your brothers. And at the time that he did that, it was all a setup. Because now, he's, now he has an assignment. He's got a commission from his father. 
His father says, you need to go. Leave those sheep alone and go. And as he's going, he doesn't realize that destiny, that, that favor and preparation are about ready to kiss. And at the time he's come and delivering them, there's a, a giant called Goliath defying the armies of the living God. He says, who's that? Everybody called him a giant except for David. He says, who's that Philistine who defies the army of the living God? Why are you guys not doing something about this? Don't you know all of you have circumcision? All of you are cut. That means God's on your side. They're not circumcised. They don't have God. What are you backing down from? See, when you understand who God is, and then you understand who you are, you'll understand that you'll get your confidence back, and that you're the exception, and you don't care how big a giant or a Philistine comes. You don't care about a demon or a devil or a principality or a power or a ruler of darkness. You don't care about a witch or a warlock or a sickness or anything that would come. Listen to me. You understand that your God is greater, and that he will position you into a place where you get the victory because it's always going to be a fixed fight. It's a fixed fight. And so now all he has to do is go through the routine. So this is what David does. Sit down really quick. Let me finish this. And David now is getting to the brook, and he gets five spruce stones. He gets, he gets his, his slingshot because he overcomes him with a sling in a, in a stone. And I come to an end. This is it. And Goliath comes, and he says, you take the best. I'm going to take your best man. Well, they sent David, and David, everybody doesn't look like David is the best man, but David's willing to go out. David's got his sling. David picks out five smooth stones. And Goliath says something that I have overlooked for a long time. He said, why do you come with me with sticks? David didn't come with him. David didn't come with sticks. He came with a sling and a stone. He goes, why do you come to me with sticks? Agromegaly. Agromegaly is a disease that giants have. It's a tumor in the pituitary gland causes them to grow, but it also causes them to have really bad eyesight. So as long as David was far, Goliath couldn't see. He thought the sticks was basically the spear and the sword that he was going to fight him with combat. So he had his guard down didn't realize that the sticks was a sling and a stone. Or, or was it sticks? Only because the word sling in the Hebrew, it means a hanging. Alex, go open that door really quick. Just open it. Put it there. Okay, boom. Come on in. Or come on, come on, come on in. You see the door. The reason why that door opens and closes right, because it was hung right. Jesus was hung. Jesus was hung right on some sticks. The stone represents Christ. The stone that followed the children of Israel was Christ, 1 Corinthians 10 says. Everywhere you go, Moses, all you got to do is strike the rock once, waters will come out. After that, sing to it and speak to it, and waters of refreshing will come and refresh you and all of Israel. The rock that followed the children was Christ. Let's go back to my text and I quit. 1 Samuel chapter 17. 
So it was when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David, and David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, that's Christ, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank in his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. Check this out. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. He overcame Goliath with the hanging of the Christ. When you understand that, the hanging of the Christ is still the answer and the antidote. The, cry, the hanging of the Christ, when you understand it, any battle that you will face is a fixed fight. Every battle that you will ever have is a fixed fight. When you understand God and who God created you to be, when you have a perception of God, and you have a and God gives you the perception of who you are. Come on. And when you can see yourself different because you saw God different, you can put your head up and you can have confidence and you can have faith. And when you have faith, you'll, have, you'll, you'll understand your creation, you'll understand your calling, and you'll understand your commission. And your calling and creation and commission, honestly, is that you're the exception. When you understand you're the exception, you walk circumspectly, rightfully before the Lord. And regardless of what giant, what trouble, what circumstance, what happens, what fight, what battle, what war stands in between you and God? I'm telling you, it's because it's a fixed fight. And when you, listen, there's some battles God wants you to engage in, some battles he doesn't want you to engage in, and then there's some battles that will choose you. When you understand that the battle has chosen you, the only thing you can do is throw your hands in the air and say, you know what, you're right, you're bigger than me, but you're not bigger than the God I serve. And when you throw your hands in the air and you begin to praise God like David did in the midst of the wilderness, and you begin to release the poetic word of God and you begin to release melodies and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Oh, there's something about that that God says, I'll do it for you. It's already a done deal. It's a fixed fight. And I've come here to tell somebody at Cornerstone Church this morning that it is a fixed fight. You have been commissioned. You have been created. You have been, my God, called to be the exception. Stand on your feet, everybody. You like that this morning? You're the exception. You are the exception. If we can roll that out really quick as they sing a quick song, let's sing something. Somebody help them. Oh, the chord. You will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior. I will never fail. Never fail. I trust in God, my Savior.
plug your nose. I baptize in the name of the Father and the Holy Ghost. So that's what I'm holding on to. Want your glasses on? You ready? Put your nose. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. bless you. If you need any kind of prayer, we're going to have some pastors up here praying for you.